I decided to treat my wife on a vacation for her birthday. We don't have kids, have a moderately stable income, and love to travel. She told me to surprise her. She only had one requirement. A hot tub. Well, finding a place within two weeks on Airbnb with a hot tub seemed to prove its own challenges. I checked Savannah, Charleston, and Myrtle Beach, Virginia. Then I thought to myself, Tennessee, the Great Smoky Mountains, all those cabins always have a hot tub. So I went ahead and did a search on Airbnb and found a place with damn near perfect reviews. A few four stars here or there, but no complaints. I booked it while at work and kept it a secret until we drove there. We arrived and passed through a beautiful gate. We drove up a driveway that was two miles long. It took us roughly 15 minutes to do that because of all the blind curves. When we punched in the code and walked in, we fell in love. The place was absolutely gorgeous. I plopped down on the couch and took off my shoes while she went to use the restroom before we dipped in the hot tub. I reached for the TV remote and noticed a paper under it. I figured it was a tub guide or something, but it wasn't. Greetings, guest. We hope you enjoy your stay in this cabin. For the best possible experience, please follow these rules closely. We ask this to ensure your safety and survival. What? Please step inside before midnight. Under no circumstance do you walk outside. Be sure all doors are locked. If the man in the hood approaches, speak to him only if he speaks to you first. Don't leave food outside. Cabins normally say this because bears, but you don't want to feed them. Before you leave in the morning, please leave us a positive review. Doing this will give you the code to leave the gate in the morning. I didn't tell my wife because, well, she is a scaredy cat. I didn't want to upset her, and I kind of figured it was some joke housekeeping left. Still, I'm a pretty paranoid person. We hopped in the hot tub and have a couple of beers, and I must say, it felt amazing. Being butt naked in warm water, staring out at the moon and stars over the mountain, made me feel serenity. But I noticed it was ten till midnight. Not trying to scare my wife, I asked her if we could go inside and make some cookies before putting on a movie. As we walked in... I locked the back door and casually checked the front. We baked the chocolate chip cookies and put on some kung fu movie before she fell asleep on me. I was on the border of slipping into sleep when I heard. I walked up to the door and peered out the side window. Mr. Boyles, I know you're in there. Please let's have a chat. Aren't you going to answer Mr. Boyles? I can smell you through the door and I can see your shadow casting through the window. I finally made sense of what was knocking, and it was a very pale man in a dark robe. I couldn't see his eyes, but I could see his cracked old mouth. What do you want from me? Ah, uh, Mr. Boyles, how very smart of you to answer back. I'm not really much for small talk, so let me cut to the point. I'm very hungry, and so are my children. May we come in? No, sir, you cannot. Oh, what a shame. How about you search in the freezer and give me some of that hamburger meat the owners left? Okay, one second. You'll leave me alone after this, I asked. You have my word. You can even slide the tray through the mail slot. I walked up to the fridge and opened the freezer door. A note was in there with no meat. If you want to keep your hand, do not slide him any food. Oh no. I walked back and told him I had nothing for him. The hooded man walked away and my wife woke up and asked why I was so pale. Before I could think of a lie, the chanting started. I peeked out of the window and saw what seemed to be about eight smaller hooded men. They were circling our cabin and chanting. I couldn't make it out because I was shaking so hard. Mr. Boyles, I'm back. I brought company. Kindly open the door and this can all end. All of them started pounding on windows and doors. My wife was crying hysterically. My senses became overloaded. I grabbed the handgun I laid on the nightstand and put it against my head. I just wanted it to stop. All the noise... I was hypnotized. Right before I pulled the trigger, all the little men did a high-pitched scream. I fired the round after my hand jerked and it went through the TV and was stopped by the chimney. My wife had tackled me and covered my ears. She knew how bad noises bothered me and wrapped a blanket around us both. I don't remember falling asleep, but I remember the sun being up and I saw where mud footprints were stomped all over the car. I wrote a positive review and received the code to leave. So if anyone here is planning on going to the Great Smoky Mountains, be wary of the hooded man.
It was a chilly but not terribly cold day in Innsbruck, Missouri. I was chopping wood when I received a notification on my Airbnb app that a family of three was trying to book my cabin for the weekend. All I had to do was hit accept. But I was actually temporarily living at my cabin. I had decided to get away from things in the city with Henry, my great Dane since we didn't have much going on. My work had shut down for two weeks, just like the rest of the world. I declined their request and sent a note explaining the situation. I felt a little bad about declining it, to be honest. They seemed like a pleasant bunch, with a cute profile picture of the kid and parents smiling in front of a scenic landscape. Almost instantly, the dad sent a follow-up message, asking if they could stay in the spare bedroom. I found it odd they knew I had a spare bedroom, but realized I was being paranoid. The whole place was listed in great detail on the app, with lots of pictures showing all of the rooms. I looked at Henry, who was chasing squirrels around the outdoor fire pit. What the heck, I thought, so I hit accept. Little did I know my peaceful weekend was about to take an unexpected turn. The family arrived Friday evening in a green pickup truck. They were friendly and polite, and I gave them a quick tour of the cabin, pointing out the key features and amenities. They seemed pleased with the place and expressed gratitude for the warm hospitality and flexibility of booking the room. What brought you guys out here? I finally asked the dad. Hunting. Suppose that's all right with you. We have our license and everything. He replied, Hunting. I found it odd, but I didn't want to come across rudely. But the truth is, I had always known Innsbruck to be a safe and quiet part of Missouri. Fishing? Sure. But nobody hunted. Sure, yeah. As long as your guys are careful, I finally said to him. Always, the dad said. As the night set in, I settled down in bed with a book and Henry, enjoying the peace and quiet of the woods. The truth is, the family was super quiet. I almost couldn't remember they were in the cabin with me. After an hour or so of reading, I began hearing strange noises coming from outside. At first I thought it was just the wind rustling the leaves, but the noises grew louder and more intense. It almost sounded like a howling. I cautiously made my way to the window, peering outside into the darkness. To my shock, I could see three figures running through the woods in the far distance. They were moving with incredible speed leaping over obstacles and chasing after something. Maybe I'm dreaming, I thought to myself. But it only took a moment before Henry was rustling awake and stretching in bed, excited to see me and ready to play. Maybe something is going on. I didn't know what to think or do. I looked at Henry again, who was fully awake now. I was worried he might have to go pee outside. I told him to stay in bed and went to make sure no one left the house with three big animals out in the woods. But when I got to the spare bedroom where the family was staying, the door was ajar. So I pushed the door open and peered in. The family was gone. A shiver went through my body, one so deep signaling to me I was in trouble. I quickly went back to my bedroom and locked the door. I gently pet Henry and got him to fall back asleep. I stayed up until morning, watching outside secretly, trying to confirm my suspicions. And around 5 a.m., the three figures emerged from the woods and came back into the cabin. I could hear their voices, saying to stay quiet to each other. I thought about calling the police, but I chose not to. It's only until Sunday morning, I thought. The next day I kept a close eye on the family, observing their behavior and movements. Well, at least I tried to. They didn't come out of their bedroom all day. Then Saturday night the same thing occurred. The noises, the howling... I tried my best to sleep through the night. I didn't want any trouble. After all, maybe I was going crazy. But around 3 a.m. I heard a new noise. It woke me up, but Henry slept through it. It was some sort of singing, almost a lullaby in a different language with more noises and fewer words. I carefully got up and looked out the window. The three figures were standing around the fire pit, swaying in rhythm with each other, burning something. It looked like some sort of animal carcass. I watched for a while as they loaded more and more of them into the fire. Dozens. I don't remember going to bed that night, but I must have. The next thing I remember is Sunday morning and how quickly it arrived. And how awkward it was. Henry and I went for a walk outside. I couldn't help but take a detour to look at the fire pit. As Henry chased a squirrel or two, I investigated the remnants of the pit. 
but it was clean, completely spotless as if it had been scrubbed with cleaning chemicals. I couldn't believe it. The family slept in, finally emerging from their room just after 2 p.m., fully packed. We had the most amazing time, and our daughter has officially become a woman, the father said to me, breaking the odd day and a half of silence between us. That's great, I gulped. I'm glad you guys enjoyed it. You have something special here in these woods, the mom chimed in. I don't believe you'd believe it if we told you how special it is. Amazing, I said. You'll have to come again. I was just trying to bring this odd weekend to a close, but the three of them all nodded enthusiastically. They thanked me again for the lovely stay and left a generous tip, which I was grateful for. But as I watched their pickup truck disappear into the distance, I couldn't help but wonder what secrets they were hiding. And what was so special in the woods around my cabin? My landlord has been renting out the apartment next to mine as an Airbnb. There are two upstairs apartments and one downstairs. I live on the top left, if you're looking from the street. Mostly we just get people visiting town for music festivals on the weekends, and they're usually up late making noise. I feel bad for the girl who lives below me since she's up walking her little dog at six every morning before going to work. I can only assume the transient tenants keep her up. Thankfully, the room doesn't get much traffic during the week. One exception was this week. We had a couple who stayed for two days. But I can't remember their features exactly, and I don't just mean their faces. They pulled into the parking lot behind our townhouse at about 7 p.m. on Sunday in a dark sedan with tinted windows. I was sitting on my balcony with my binoculars, bird watching. Sounds boring, I know, but my mom got me into it when I was really young, and I watched them park and get their suitcases from the trunk. I know I got a good look at them, but the best description I can give is this. The man was tallish, maybe somewhere between 5 foot 10 and 6 foot 2, with brown or maybe black hair. He was wearing a white t-shirt and blue jeans, and was one of those ageless guys who could be anywhere from 25 to 40 years old. The woman he was with was similarly bland, with hair that may have been a darker blonde, brown, or maybe even black depending on how the sun hit it. She looked about average height and was as ageless as her partner. She had on a gray dress, or a blue one. I don't know. They were both white, but that's about the only definitive thing I can remember. They spoke to each other quietly as they brought their stuff around to the front door and she occasionally laughed. It was a bubbly giggle that was somehow shrill instead of cute. I bumped into them on the stairs once or twice during their stay, but we didn't say much to each other. The man tipped the brim of his hat at me the first time we met and said hello. It was a dark baseball cap like the kind superheroes wear when they're undercover in the movies. On the second evening of their stay, I ran into my downstairs neighbor outside. I asked her if she had met the couple. She furrowed her brow and told me she thought she'd heard them bring in their stuff, but that she hadn't heard anything since. In fact, she said it had been eerily quiet. She can usually hear me walking around, but hadn't heard anything of the lodgers. Maybe they spent most of their time out exploring the city. Her eyebrows were still in a knot. I don't know how long she'd been living there, but I had moved in two months before. I had tried to get to know her, but she was never in the mood to chat. She was always home at night and diligent about locking our communal front door. I got the sense that she was a bit anxious and a bit of a loner. Later that night, I went out with friends for a few beers and got back pretty late. The weather's been getting a lot warmer and our landlord hasn't turned on the air conditioning yet, so my apartment was hot when I got home. I opened the balcony door and sat outside with another beer, just enjoying the breeze. It must have been about half past two. I was a little drunk, and I was starting to doze off when I heard a giggle below me. My eyes jolted open, but I didn't move. There were whispers right beneath my balcony. I strained to hear. It was the couple. I very carefully tried to move to where I could see them without making any noise. I could have just said hello, but why were they whispering outside at 2.30 a.m.? Since they were right below me, I couldn't quite see them, but they were at my neighbor's window. I lay down and tried to look through the cracks in the wooden balcony. I looked up and realized I could see their reflection in another house's window, but it was too far to make out clearly. The man had started whispering a bit louder, and not in English. Carefully, 
I got up and grabbed my binoculars from the side table by my chair and lay back down to look at their reflection. The first thing I noticed was that even in the darkness, I could see their eyes really clearly. They appeared to be faintly glowing. The man was still whispering and repeating himself as though it were an incantation. They were both staring into my neighbor's window. He then lifted his hands and tried to open the window. I know I should have been calling the police by then, but I was drunk and terrified. He pushed upward on the window firmly and then laughed. Clever girl, he said in a fake accent. The woman sighed. I'm afraid it's locked, he continued. Then he gently grabbed his partner's arm and produced a knife from the back of his jeans. I was breathing shakily and trying to keep steady so they wouldn't hear me. He raised the knife and cut it into her arm. He made a long gash from her inner elbow to the wrist, and blood quickly started spilling from it, almost black in the darkness. She touched it with her other hand and drew a symbol on the window in blood. They both closed their eyes and placed one palm on the window. The woman spoke. And as you have protected yourself against us, you will not be taken this night. She paused, and they both dropped their hands and looked at each other. But we'll be back. They both grinned, their white teeth bright against the dark. I put down my binoculars and continued to hold still. They got into their sedan right then and drove away. I haven't seen them since, but I've been checking the parking lot for a dark car every day. There was nothing on the window the next morning.